Let us pray. Father, your word tells us that as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. We thank you that as we gather this morning, we are reminded by looking around us of the beauty of your creation and of the many things that you have given to us to live and thrive. We are sorry, Father, that so often we forget your goodness to us and we find ourselves wandering away from the things that you would have us do, that we find ourselves drifting into ways of thinking that do not honour you, using words that do not build up but tear down, finding those old patterns of sin in our lives. So on this Harvest Sunday, as we reflect again upon your goodness, we ask that you would fill us with your grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit we would know again of your mighty love. And that through that grace and through that love we would go and live for your kingdom sharing the good things that you have given to us so that more people may know of your calling and the hope that there is to be found in your precious Son. In his name and for your sake we offer our prayers to you and we continue in that attitude of prayer by sharing together that beautiful prayer given by Jesus to his friends that Christians down throughout the years have shared together uniting us as a family of believers. We say together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, we continue as we worship our holy God together, this time with the words of Psalm 65, verses 9 to 13. Psalm 65, verses 9 to 13. Let's offer this to God as a sacrifice of praise.
One of the lovely things about our Harvest morning service is, of course, the junior choir come to sing for us. And we have them at the front, and you're all looking great. And we're really looking forward to coming to share with us today. God is making a wonderful world. Done everybody, thank you so much for that. And we want to say a big thank you to Maureen and to Dorothy for all their work with you over the year. And it was really interesting to hear what you were singing because it fits in so nicely, doesn't it, with what we're here to do today. God is making a wonderful world, and these fr fruits and flowers and things that are in the world are reminding us of that. But you reminded us of something really important as well that we have a job to do, don't we? In being the people that God would use to tell others of his love and look after this world that he has given to us. And that's a job for all of us. And you really helped us to think about that today. So thank you so much. That was really good. So, if there are any other boys and girls here today that would like to come up to the front, this is your time to do so. And I'll see you there. So, we're going to do something a wee bit different today. Um, I want you to come over to me. Instead of sitting there, come over to me this time. Um, and have a wee seat around here somewhere. Is that alright? Can we do that? Just over here on the floor? What? Aye, anywhere at all. Find a good spot. Come on over, come on over, come on over, come on over. Come on, come on, come on. It's alright. It's totally fine. Amazing. Brilliant. Jobs are good. Right. So, 
There's lots of things in the church today that are not usually in the church, aren't there? What do we see in the church is not usually in the church. Yeah. Fruit? Yeah. Anything else? Vegetables? Yeah. Food? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's that? Carrots. Carrots? Yes. That, we do. There's loads of carrots. We've got loads of carrots this year, actually. Sometimes we don't get lots of carrots, but we've got loads of carrots this year. Yeah. Pumpkins, yeah. So we've got two, two at the front, and there's one in the vestibule, uh, that, that way room at the back of the church as well. Yeah. Flowers, yeah. Some beautiful flowers, lovely colours, aren't they? Yeah. Cereal. cereal. What cereal did you spot? Cocoa rice. Oh, cocoa rice. <laughs> Weetabix. Was there Weetabix somewhere? Was there? Uh, I think so. Uh, yeah. Three pineapples. Three pineapples. Yeah, there's two. There's one there, and I think there might be one down in the vestibule as well. There might be four. I don't know. But you spotted something else, didn't you? What did you spot? Oh, what's that? It's for baptizing. Yes, it is. Um, so that's called the baptismal font. Um, and inside that font is a wee drop of water. And what we're going to do in a wee minute is we're going to invite three special people to come up to the front. It's Laura and Christopher and their wee baby called Oliver. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray that God would bless them as a family. And then I'm going to put my hand in the font. And I'm going to dr- bring out a wee bit of water. And I'm going to put a wee bit of water on Oliver's head three times. And you know what's going to happen? He's not going to cry because we have made a wee deal that he's not going to cry. So it's all good because I've only ever had one baby cry when I've had a baptism. Only one. And we're going to keep that record. Okay? So I'm going to put the water on his head three times. Does anybody know why I might do it three times? Why not once or four times or six times? Why three times? Yeah? Think about how we understand what God is and God is like. Yeah, do you know? Because there's three people in the family. That's a really good guess, but that's not the right answer. But that was a good guess. Yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spot on. Good man. So what we want is that the love of God to be known in this family. And we want Oliver to be blessed. By God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing. It's only water. And water's not magic. It doesn't do anything to him. It's a wee sign that reminds us all of God's love. And what happened in the Bible a long, long time ago is that people used to give a special sign that God gave to them, to their children. And the idea was that when their children grew up, they could come to know God themselves. Because the faith that their parents had, they passed on to their children. So what we do today is that we put some water on Oliver's head. And that's a sign of the faith that his mommy and daddy have. And they are saying to the church that they want to bring him up in the same faith. And when he's older, then he can come and do it for himself. So why water is the last big thing I want to ask you. What, what, what do you think? That, why, why do we use water as the sign of a baptism? Yeah. You want to say? What do you want to say? I do know that story. It's a good story in the Bible, isn't it? About Moses in the water and in the basket. And the the thing is, what's good about Moses is, Moses, there's a story of a wee baby, and God had a great plan for him, didn't it? God had a great plan for Moses to grow up and to know him and to serve him, and that's what we pray for Oliver too. And also, I don't know why I'm saying this, but Oh, yeah. Well, we can have we chat about that after. What about that? Would that do? Okay, good man. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask for God to bless Oliver so that when he grows up, he can know God and serve him. But the last week thing I wanted to ask you is why do we think we use water? Any idea? Yeah? <coughs> no, it's just ordinary water. It's just ordinary water. There's nothing special. Water's just out of the tap. It's just ordinary water. Why do we think we use water? What does Jesus do for our sins when he died on the cross? Yeah? 
washes our sins away. Yeah. So the sign is that this is a promise that if Oliver grows up in the faith and trusts in Jesus, Jesus will wash away his sins. And we are putting a wee sign on him so that when he grows up, he can remember this and his mummy and daddy can tell him about it and pass on the faith that is theirs to him. So we're asking for God to bless the family. We're asking for God to bless Oliver. And we're asking everybody in this building that they would join in and that they would pray for all the children in the church and for Oliver and that we would have a place here in Craig where we can all grow up knowing God. Is that okay? Does that make sense? So will we invite Laura and Christopher and Oliver to come up now, will we? And will we do this? Okay. So can I ask you to just shimmy over this way? So that they can come and stand there. Because I don't want them to stand on you. And I don't want them to kick one of the apples or something by accident when they're up here either. So we want to create a wee bit of space for them. Lovely. Thank you. Right guys, can I just lift this? Lovely. Alright. Jesus said... All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. On Pentecost, when Peter preached, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. So, Christopher and Laura have brought Oliver to come and to be baptized this morning, and they are promising that they would create a home for him to grow up where he would know Jesus and have the opportunity to learn what it means to follow him. We, as a church community, are promising that this would always be a place where he can come and where he can know of that same Jesus. That as a community of faith, together we would be a place where all of the children connected here would be able to know God's love. So Oliver, nothing happens to you here today. We just put some water on you. And what we are saying to you is this. That even though you don't know it yet, Jesus died for you. And when you grow up, and when you come to know what that means, you can come to this table, and you can eat bread, and drink wine, and tell the whole world that you have this promise that we put upon you today. So, I'm going to ask your mommy and daddy some questions. And then we'll get to the baptism itself. So. Okay. Christopher and Laura. Are you affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your saviour from sin and as the Lord of your life? Depending upon God's grace... Are you committed to living as followers of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Are you willing to provide a Christian home for Oliver and bring him up in the worship and teaching of the church so that he may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? Lovely. As a church community, as a congregation gathered in Jesus' name, are you willing to receive Oliver into the fellowship of this church? And do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for him and for his family? If you would be so willing to promise, I invite you to stand. Here we go. Oliver, Jesus died for you and rose for you so that you would know the fullness of life. And as we place this sign upon your head in these moments, we pray.
that by God's grace you will come to know this Jesus and that you will indeed be in his name a mighty man of God. To that end, I baptise you, Oliver Christopher Armstrong, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that God's blessing would be upon you and within you now and indeed forevermore. Amen. We share together the words of the Aaronotic Blessing. Father, we thank you for these special moments. And we pray, Lord, that now as Oliver is received into the fellowship of this church and engaged to be the Lord's, that he would indeed grow in this promise to come and follow Jesus for himself and to know this to be a place where he is safe and loved and where the fellowship of God's people pull together for your grace. Bless this family. Be close to them and know them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, you can take a wee seat for a moment. You're not released just yet. Because um, we want to give to you a little Bible, Oliver. Um, now, you can't read this yet. But your mum and daddy are going to read it to you. And there's a couple of verses that we talk about that are important to you as a family. And in one of those verses, Paul tells us to not be anxious about anything, but to go to him and to know his help and his strength. And I pray that as you grow up as a family, you would know of God's help. And also, just like Moses, as we heard earlier on, didn't we? About how God had a lovely plan for Moses' life. We know that God has a plan for your life. And we pray that your mummy and daddy will take this and use it and tell you all about that. Is that all right? I can add to you. All right. God bless you. Have a wee seat. Thank you so much. Now, before you go out to Kitzel, we're going to sing a wee hymn together. And that wee hymn is a hymn chosen by Laura and Christopher as one of their favourites. And it's all about putting into God's hands the times of our lives. So, it's number 556. And we say, Father, I place into your hands. And after we have that wee hymn, you can go out to Kitzel. All right? Let's stand and worship God.
Good morning, everyone. Can I just express the warmest of welcomes to you all on this Harvest Sunday when we come to thank God for the fruits of his creation. And I pray that we would continue to know his blessing as we worship together. Uh, I'd like to say a big welcome to uh, friends and family of uh, Christopher and Laura who are here with us today for this special occasion. And I pray that you've been warmly welcomed and uh, feel loved here among us. And uh, we're so delighted that we've had the opportunity to welcome Oliver into our church family today. And he kept up his side of the deal really well. Um, and that's great. So I'm just going to make some announcements at this point uh, of uh, our service this morning. Um, you're all very welcome back to church this evening at 7 p.m. for our uh, continuing of the celebration of the harvest, where we'll have special music from the church choir. Uh, uh, so please do come along this evening to our harvest and share in the harvest supper. That will happen after that just like to say a big thank you uh, to John and to the choir, to Gordon on the organ, uh, to uh, the junior choir and to uh, Maureen and Dorothy who have already said thank you for uh, all the events, uh, practices rather, that they put in for today's service. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who has provided uh, fruits, flowers and long life goods, vegetables, things like that for us to decorate the church so beautifully. And thank you to the folk who turned up on Friday to lend a hand. Uh, for that uh, preparation and decorating. Um, if you're out this evening and you have a few moments to spare, uh, a few hands to help uh, tidy up the church afterwards would be much appreciated. So please, if you're able to do that, uh, thank you. Thank you also for the generosity of those who have contributed to our harvest appeal. Uh, you'll see that there'll be that there are uh, envelopes in the pews for you to do that. And again, any contribution uh, would be much appreciated. And as is normally the case, our harvest gift day envelopes proceeds go for the property fund to maintain and keep our buildings in good use for the work of God's mission in this place. Um, I'd also like to point to some other uh, items on the news sheet. Next Lord's Day at the normal time, we gather at 11 a.m. for our service of communion. Communion was moved. Normally, it's the first Sunday in October, but on this occasion, it's next Sunday, the 20th. Um, and then we have our Cafe Connect at 6.30 p.m. in the Allen Hall. Blobs will meet on Tuesday at quarter past nine in the McIntyre Suite. Morning Watch will meet on Tuesday as well, quarter to 11 in the session room, followed by Bruce Brothers at 12.30 in the McIntyre Suite. The Wednesday Bible Study Group will meet uh, on the 16th of October at 10.30, and you see information about the location of the meeting there, and all are very welcome to come along to that. Uh, for those who are helping out with Kids Zone or Crash next Lord's Day, if anyone is a communicant and would like to have communion prior to the service because they'll miss the opportunity to have it during if you could come and meet me in the office about 20 to 11 um, next Sunday morning then we'll have a short time of communion for those folk who are unable to be in the service due to helping out with those things. We'd like to say a big thank you to those involved in last week's tear fund service and also those who provided refreshments after the service. There is still an opportunity to donate to the work of tear fund if you haven't had the opportunity to do so and would like to. Um, you can place a donation on the collection plate marked tear fund or if you speak to Maureen or to myself we can uh, help you to get that sorted. Uh, I believe they are all uh, the announcements, and we now turn our hearts and our minds towards God's Word. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, and I mentioned it briefly uh, at the point of the baptism there moments ago. And it's Acts chapter 2, and we'll be starting at verse 29. That's Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 29, and you'll find that on page 1094 of the Pew Bible. This is the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath 
that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Saying what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amen. And we thank God for his word. second reading from the scriptures today is from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 17, and we'll begin at the first verse, and you'll find that on page 16 of the Pew Bible, Genesis chapter 17, starting at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, 
I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Cana, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not of your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Amen. And once again, we thank God for his word. Before we come to sing together, let's just pause for a moment to pray for the world and for the church, giving our intercessory prayers to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all of the things in the church today, reminding us of the world that you have given to us. We pray for that world. We pray for a world that is hurting, for a world that knows loss and grief and challenge and struggle. And even though there is enough to share, the world and the people in the world still fight and push and take still that desire to be one up on someone else or that desire to have more seems to be so loud and prevalent so we pray Father for those who find themselves the victim of injustice those who see the world that is around them as a world where they are forgotten or downtrodden. We think of those who would work hard to provide the means for food or for resources and don't get a fair pay for what they produce. For those who live in lands where little grows and if there were the resources and the tools available, that could change. We pray for agencies and for people who would go to these places to seek to bring help and to make change. And those from in their own governments and from in their own communities that are stepping up and reaching out to seek a better world. We pray for all of those who would seek to see a world that is fair and just and where the things that are available are shared and where people care. Father, we thank you for all of the folk who provide us with what we have, those who work in the fields, those who work in the factories, those who drive vehicles, those who deliver things, those who provide the resources and tools and 
um, equipment so that all of the things that we have on our tables to eat and enjoy are so readily available to us. We pray that we would not take that for granted and that we would be inspired by the beauty of your creation and by this bounty that we have around us to be those who would share what we have. Father, on this uh, special day, when we have had the beautiful opportunity to share in the sacrament of baptism, we ask that you would write on our hearts your mighty promises. And we thank you for your mercy and for your goodness. And we ask that you would bless in increasing measure all who would come to this place and would know this place as their church community. We pray for all of the children in this church, those that are here Sunday by Sunday, those who come occasionally, and those who come to these buildings to share in an organization. We ask, Father, that you would bless each and every one of them. And whatever is going on in their lives, be it stresses of school or friendship, or be it just the comings and goings of growing up, we pray that they would know that you are with them and that your love for them is real. We pray that you would bless all the families of our church, that their homes would be a place where they could know Jesus better so that they may leave their homes and go about their daily lives and serve him more. Father, there are so many other things that we could pray for today, but we simply give to you the thoughts and worries and burdens and concerns that are in our own heads and hearts. We present them to you, and we ask that you would take them in the name of Jesus, that they would be left at your throne of grace. And while we may come with very different challenges, very different concerns, very different worries, there is a sense of unity as we come together and sit in this place and take these moments to worship and to pray. So as a church family, we bear each other's burdens. We care for those sitting next to us and love them in your name. And we present all of our prayers for the sake of your Son and for your glory. Amen. Uh, we stand and sing together. And we do so with the words of number 53, Fountain of Mercy, number 53. <laughs>
I would just like to take a few moments to try and tie together a lot of the things that we have been thinking about and singing about and reflecting about in the service today. There are many privileges in the ministry. There is the privilege to be there as a couple get married. There is the privilege to even conduct a funeral service for a long-standing member of the church that has served the Lord faithfully. There's the opportunity to talk to people about their lives of faith and to share over a cup of tea about what's going on with them. There's the opportunity to work alongside young people and children and to hope that by example and sometimes by a bit of sweat and tears that by sharing with them that they may glimpse something of Jesus and grow up to follow him. But one of the greatest privileges above all of that is to do what I just did there a few moments ago, and that is to baptize a child and to see a family bringing their child into the life of the church community. The reason why that's such a privilege is because the events that we just shared a few moments ago and the symbols that we used are greater than any words of mine to display the grace and wonder of God's love. You see, when Christopher and Laura bring Oliver to the font and we put that water on his head, we are saying a few things that are very, very important. First of all, we are saying that we entrust Oliver to God's grace that our faith and our lives and all that we have within them are not based upon our ability to hold on to God, are not based upon our ability to get it right or to tick all the boxes or to do all of the things that God would have us do. God's grace is given to us as a beautiful gift. His promises that he would love us and walk with us throughout the days of our lives are assured to us and are not based upon our ability to achieve anything. It is God's beautiful grace. God sent his son to die for our sins, not because we deserved it, not because we did anything that would warrant it, but simply because of his grace. And the promises that we have remembered today, that if Oliver grows up to know this Jesus, the promises of that Jesus are his, and he has done nothing to warrant it or deserve it. It is God's grace. That's the promise that we remember today when we stand together around that font. The other thing that we remember is that we are meant to be a family of believers people who come here and actually care for one another as a family of believers. When we chatted before the service about the preparations for the service, I asked Laura and Christopher, were they going to have godparents? And of course, as you say, that they didn't do that. And one of the reasons why in the Presbyterian church and in the Reformed faith we normally don't have godparents is because the idea is that the church community are the godparents of every child within the church, that the church community have a responsibility to create a place where children can grow in their faith. And that's why I invited you to stand. And that's why I invited you to make that promise. Because what we are promising is that we will get alongside Laura and Christopher so that they know that we have their back as they seek to bring up their beautiful son in the faith and in this community of believers. And the other thing is as well, the symbol of the promise that we have placed upon Oliver's head today as such, that back in the day, in the dark days of the Old Testament, God spoke to Abraham and gave to Abraham a sign of his promise. And the idea was thus, that God would be his God, and through Abraham, the people would be God's people. And God would never forsake or abandon them. He would be their God, and this would be a promise that would last forever, not just for a season, not just for a time, but forever, that he would be their God, and that they would be his people. And the symbol he gave to them 
was the sign of circumcision. And that's important because that sign pointed forward to something. Because, of course, with circumcision and the shedding of blood, that pointed forward to something. And that was that in order for this covenant to be signed and sealed and secured, there would need to be a sacrifice for sin. You see, the sign of the God's promise could continue to be used. People could continue to use it and remember that God's promises. But the problem was, if you like, all of these sins are building up and they're not being atoned for. They're not being covered. They're building up and building up. And no matter how hard the people try to follow God and to hold on to his commandments and to his laws, no matter how hard they try to do that, they were never going to achieve what God had set out for them. The law was not just a symbol of God's perfection, but was also a symbol that they would never be able to get to that perfection by their own strength. It pointed forward to a sacrifice having to be made for the covering and forgiveness of sin. Jesus came and died on the cross, and one drop of his blood is worth more than anything worth more than all the gold and all the produce of the whole world. And his blood being shed meant that the sins of the people were covered. They were washed away. And that's why the sign of the covenant changed from circumcision, pointing forward to the sacrifice that we need to make, to pointing back to the sacrifice that was made. And that's why we use water today, because what we say to Oliver to his family and to all of us is that we look back to the cross and we use water to remind ourselves that Jesus died for the sins of his people before they knew anything about it. Just like the covenant was given to Abraham and his family, this beautiful covenant of water is given to the family of believers in this place to tell them that before they knew a thing about it, God's grace to unite a family of believers was in action. And that grace was that Jesus would die for the sins of his people. The water points back to that. And that's why we only get baptized once, because the sign and seal is upon us once. And when we grow to know the Lord and seek to take this promise to be ours, we come to this table and we eat and drink and we come to this table often so that we can continually be guided and prompted and profess our faith to the world by, if you like, bringing the engagement to marriage. So today, what I would want us to think about on this beautiful day of harvest is to look around this church and to see all these beautiful things that we have and to remember God's goodness to us, but to remember that his grace dwarfs all of this into insignificance. His grace that he would die for our sins before we had any knowledge that we had sins that he needed to die for. Before we had any knowledge of any problem in our own heart, he sent his son to die for our sins. And that this water is a reminder for us of that. It is a reminder of God's goodness to us. It is a reminder of our need to cleave together as a family so that Oliver and all the boys and the girls of this place can grow up and know Jesus better. And it is a reminder of Jesus and his death so that we might live. It is a reminder of what he did for us so that we could live for him. I wonder, could we take a wee moment to pray? Let's pray. Father, We thank you for that everlasting covenant that you gave to Abraham, that you would be his God, and that through him there would be a people who would be your people, those who would use a sign to remind themselves of that promise, to pass down the faith to those that went ahead of them, so that when children grew up, they could come and claim that faith for themselves. And we thank you for that beautiful picture that is shown to us of Jesus. That as we sign and seal our children in this place with this water, we pray that all of them would grow up and would come to claim that for themselves and come to your table and tell the world that they have claimed that promise. We pray once again 
for Oliver and for his family. And we ask that you would put your arms around them and bless them. And that through your grace and through us binding together as a family of believers and through us looking to the cross, this would indeed be a place where that everlasting covenant still continues to beat and still continues to lead and inspire a people who love God and love their neighbor and would seek to reach out for his sake. We ask all of this in and through the name of Jesus, our friend and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father, on this day where we have taken time to thank you for all of your goodness to us and how that has been represented in this service, we pray, Lord, that that sense of your goodness and grace would lead us and inspire us as we present this offering to you and go to live for your glory. Father, we ask that this service as it ends would be the beginning or the continuing of our service to be those who would go and love you and love one another to go and speak of Jesus and his death, his resurrection and his glorious kingdom. We ask that the grace of that Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, you our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be upon us this day and indeed forevermore.
Thank you.